What's up guys? Today on Dirt Lifestyle, we are going to tackle axles. This is a video that I've been getting asked to do for months and I'm excited to finally get to it. The world of axles is humongous and there's no way in one video you could tackle it all unless it's like six hours long. Consider this like a beginner's swap guide. I wanna go through um, all the basics from high pinion versus low pinion, uh, talk about spline count, what is a stub shaft, stuff like that. So I wanna cover all the basics on three very popular axles for swapping. The first axle we're gonna look at today is a Dana 30 high pinion out of a 99 Jeep Cherokee. The second axle we're gonna get into today is a Dana 44 high pinion out of a 76 Ford F-150. The third axle we're gonna get into today is a Dana 60 high pinion out of a 2003 Ford F-350. We're only gonna be talking about front axles in this video, and in my opinion, the only front axles worth doing a swap are high pinion axles. Don't get me wrong, low pinion axles can be built very strong in a front end application as well, um, but you're gonna gain a 30% increase in strength by going to a high pinion axle. Due to the time, the cost, and the effort that it takes to swap an axle, I seek out high pinion um, front axles exclusively for the builds that I put together. So what does high pinion and low pinion even mean? High pinion means that your pinion gear is set up in an orientation where it is higher than the center line of your ring gear. This is your pinion gear, this is your ring gear. When it's higher like this, they actually reverse cut um, your ring and pinion to make it to where as you accelerate, it draws the pinion gear into the ring gear, uh, making it stronger. This is where you get the 30% increase in strength. If you have a low pinion, it's actually gonna be a different gear set, but I'm gonna use these as an example anyway. Whenever you accelerate going forward, it's going to be pushing your pinion gear away from your ring gear. This is gonna cause what's called deflection. What people are talking about when they talk about deflection is the separation of the teeth of your pinion gear from your ring gear. And what this will do is make it weaker because it's less tooth to tooth contact and you'll actually start breaking off teeth from your ring gear. And sometimes you can, I mean, people just grenade the entire thing. The strength of your ring and pinion is directly correlated to the size. In a higher horsepower application, you definitely want the biggest ring and pinion that you can fit in your application. The ring and pinion in this Dana 30 is tiny. It's seven and an eighth inches. The ring and pinion for the Dana 44 is a little bit better. We're at eight and a half inches. And the ring and pinion for the Dana 60, I thought was nine and a half inches, but I looked it up last night. And for this axle, people online are saying this is a 10 inch ring and pinion, which is very large. Next thing I wanna talk about is gonna be the axle shaft size and strength for these three axles. First thing you need to look at when selecting an axle is going to be spline count. For the purposes of this part of the video, we're just gonna be talking about spline count on the inner axle shaft. So on a Dana 30, you're at 27 splines. A spline in the world of Dana is a unit of measure like an inch or a millimeter. So a 27 spline axle shaft is 1.13 inches across. A Dana 44 is 30 splines. That equates to an axle shaft that is 1.31 inches across. Increase in strength, of course. A Dana 60 axle shaft is a 35 spline, which equates to one and a half inches across. The next thing you need to consider whenever you're talking about axle shafts is gonna be material type. So this is a standard steel stock axle shaft. This is a standard steel stock axle shaft. And this is an aftermarket chromoly axle shaft. Chromoly is basically a material type that is extremely, extremely strong, um, in, at least in comparison to your standard steel axle. Um, this deflects breakage from a, a number of different aspects. One being it can rotate a lot farther around than a standard steel axle shaft. So your standard steel axle shaft is good for about 30 to 35 degrees of rotation before it breaks. A chromoly axle shaft, from what I can find online, can twist up to 130 to 135 degrees before it breaks. If you have a tire and you're bouncing it on and off the ground, that's putting a ton of twisting force on your axle shaft itself. Because this is applying pressure back to whatever's twisting it, it's actually slowing down the shock load from that tire bouncing to the axle shaft just because it's providing a certain amount of resistance. So because of that, you're not gonna be able to just shock it into pieces nearly as easily as you can a stock axle shaft. There's something else to consider whenever you're talking about the material type and strength, and that's the actual shear strength. This is, from what I can find online, you know, there's a number of different 
numbers that are thrown around, but 20 to 30 percent, um, and sometimes as high as 40, depending on the brand, is a number that's thrown around as far as the percentage of strength over a stock axle shaft. You can't talk about strong aftermarket axle shafts without talking about RCV. They're not a sponsor of this video or anything, but I happen to really like their products. Um, I've worked with them in the past, and they've impressed me in a number of ways. Your U-joint size directly correlates with the axle strength. So a Dana 30 and the Dana 44, these are both really similar, if not the exact same actually. New, newer Dana 30s got to where they used a lot bigger U-joints because that was a failing point in the older versions. Um, the Dana 60s, you can see, is clearly a way bigger U-joint. That is gonna provide so much more strength than these will. But the aftermarket's pretty big, so there are aftermarket U-joints you can get that don't have needle bearings, and that is going to substantially increase the strength of your U-joint. That is an option if you wanna stick to whatever axle shaft you have now, but you want to eliminate um, the chances of breaking that U-joint. What's nice about an RCV is the RCV eliminates the U-joint altogether, going to constant velocity joint, and this constant velocity joint has the same strength turned up to a 45 degree angle as it has whenever it's straight. When you turn a U-joint up to 45 degrees, you substantially decrease the strength and reliability of the joint. The last thing we need to consider in terms of axle shafts is going to be the stub shaft. The spline count on the stub shaft does not always match the spline count of your inner shaft. It's nice if you can get an aftermarket shaft or if you can just find an axle that comes stock to where the stub shaft is the same spline count as your inner shaft, but that's not always the case. So with this Dana 30, it's a 27 spline inner shaft and a 27 spline stub shaft. That's great. This uh, old school Dana 44, it's a 30 spline inner shaft, but only a 19 spline outer shaft. These splines are not measured the same way as Dana does on the inner. I don't know why they do that. I guess just to make things extra confusing for guys like me, but this doesn't actually equate to what a 19 spline stub would be. It equates to basically the same as a 27 spline. So the stub shafts on these two axles are almost um, the exact same if you measured them with a micrometer. This Dana 60 has a 30 spline stub shaft, but a 35 spline inner shaft. When you get to an 05 or newer Super Duty, everything I can find online says that they used a 35 spline stub and a 35 spline inner. When you're looking at an axle for a swap, a very important part is width. This one ton axle, this Dana 60 out of a Super Duty, is 67 inches from wheel mount surface to wheel mount surface. This 76 F150, is 65 inches from wheel mount surface to wheel mount surface. The Dana 30 is 60 and three quarter inches wheel mount surface to wheel mount surface. Something else worth considering is gonna be hub selection. Now, what axle you buy will somewhat determine whether or not you're gonna have a selectable hub or not. And that means taking the hub, turning it on or off. Now, there's a few different advantages for having selectable hubs or not having selectable hubs. I myself, if I was building an off-road only vehicle, um, I would try to find an axle that doesn't have selectable hubs because I have selectable hubs and they're just locked in all the time. I, if I'm going 70 miles an hour down the freeway or if I'm on a trail, I just keep them locked in. But I also, I barely drive it on the street. I wanna be clear about that. It's really just once a year whenever I'm in Moab, Utah and I can get away with it. Now, if you have a vehicle that you're driving to work, if you have a vehicle you drive to the trail, everything else, it's nice to be able to turn those hubs off and you can actually pick up a little bit of efficiency, you know, get a couple miles per gallon out of doing that. And it's not rotating, um, you know, all the internals and stuff on your front axle, which is kind of nice. There's some pros and cons to each. It's up to you to decide what you're looking for. An important part of choosing one of these axles is your ground clearance. So the bigger ring and pinion you have, the less clearance you're gonna have between um, the bottom of your tire and the bottom of the axle. So I'm gonna take a minute, I'm gonna measure these three axles and we'll note the results. Super Duty Dana 60. It's about six and a quarter inches from the bottom of the housing to the center line of the housing. 76 F-150 is about five inches from the bottom of the housing to the center line of the housing. 99 XJ is four and a half inches from the bottom of the housing to the center line of the housing. 
So we have two inches difference in axle clearance between the Dana 30 and the Dana 60. That might not sound like a lot, but it really is. Um, that would be like going from a 36 to a 40, and I actually went from a 36 to a 40, and I can tell you that it's night and day. <laughs> it's not even comparable. Um, you know, I was constantly getting that front axle hung up on everything with a 36, and as soon as I went to a 40, it never touches anything really, unless I'm in really big rocks. That's another thing. I couldn't even do really big rocks before the 36, but the 40, all day long, I love them, they're great. So two inches does not sound like a lot, but in the off-road world, when it comes to low-hanging fruit like that, it actually makes a really big difference. I love to go across the United States and take my Jeep wheeling. Um, one of my favorite places to go is Moab, Utah. So my recommendations are gonna be based on the idea that I can drive 19 hours from here in Washington down to Moab and confidently wheel for a week on the recommendation that I'm about to give. Uh, so hope it would all be in hopes that the axle could stay together for that week and not break on the first day and ruin all of that time, money, and effort. My recommendations for the Dana 30 and Dana 44 are actually kind of tricky. These axles need to be built if you plan on wheeling them pretty hard. Um, there are some exceptions to that and there always is to almost any rule. With the Dana 30, we'll start there. I wouldn't recommend putting it in anything bigger than like a TJ or than a Jeep Cherokee, something like that. Something that's small, something that's lightweight. Um, if you want to have a three quarter ton or bigger, just don't even consider the Dana 30. Actually, I wouldn't consider a Dana 44. If you plan on really wheeling, I wouldn't recommend either one of those on a three quarter ton or bigger. But on something small, they can actually be pretty damn strong. And I know a lot of people don't like to hear that because a lot of people have broke them. But if you have the high pinion version, that's gonna handle a little bit more power. And if you have you know, chromoly axle shafts and some of the other various upgrades that are available for these axles, you can actually build them pretty damn good. I would say in stock form, I would feel pretty confident um, wheeling hard on a Dana 30 high pinion and with like a 33 inch tire on an XJ or a TJ, YJ included. If you wanna go bigger than that, you wanna go bigger than a 33, I would definitely recommend looking at a set of chromoly axle shafts and um, you're gonna wanna put a truss on that bad boy. They're just too easy to bend. You could just get a little bit too much wheel hop um, and it's just really easy to come down and put a nice little smiley face in your front axle. It's been done. Even though you have a small lightweight rig, what you're doing with it is everything. So my TJ, you can do a lot with a very small axle when it's just me and a buddy and some lunch. But if I was going to pack it down and literally fill every single seat, and I don't even know where we'd put our camping gear because they don't make accommodations for that in TJs, but let's just say we jam it full of tents and beer and everything else that you want to take on an overnight trip somewhere. Worst case scenario is that you're coming down something really steep and then it gets really ledgy and boom, you get that front end to just come down with all that weight behind it. It's just a recipe for disaster. Same thing goes for JKs, XJs, anything like that. If you're considering a half ton or smaller axle, you have to think about what you're doing with it. If you built like the ultimate Dana 30 and you've got 30 spline outers, 30 spline inners, I mean, you, you know, you did like hardened gear sets, micro polished gear set. I mean, you really just went hog wild on this thing. I would definitely not go bigger than a 37. Um, that's with like a V6. If you plan on going to the V8, don't, just don't even, don't go there. Just, if you're gonna do a V8, I would recommend a one ton. Get something that has a strong ring and pinion that isn't just gonna scatter all over the trail whenever you, you know, give it full throttle. When we're talking about a Dana 44, like what I have in my TJ, a high pinion Dana 44, it's got real nice thick axle tubes, you know, heavy duty outers, things like that. I probably wouldn't go bigger than a 35, and that actually comes from experience. It didn't last long on those stock axle shafts. I broke three sets of stock axle shafts inside of a year, and that was on a 36. So once I went to chromolies, it was a completely different story. I never broke the set of chromolies that I had in there for eight years. And then over the last year, I upgraded RCV, so I'm definitely not worried. The shafts that I have now are pretty sweet. So instead of having a 19 spline stub, I have a 30 spline inner shaft and a 30 spline stub. This is my third set of 40 inch tall tires on it. With the Dana 44, I think that a 40 is as big as I would go. I have seen people run 42s on Dana 44s and chrome ollies and just built, built to the nines, but me personally, I would feel uncomfortable going bigger than what I have now. 
The list of upgrades that I would recommend are just pretty much the same as the Dana 30. You know, there's a lot of different options out there to make it stronger. Um, you can actually put a Dana 50 ring and pinion in one of these with a kit from a company called Jantz Engineering, and they make some pretty cool stuff. They actually make a kit that you can upgrade that ring and pinion to a JK ring and pinion, because the JK44 has a larger ring and pinion um, than what I've got in mind. So there's some options out there, which is really nice. Even though I have half inch thick axle tubes on this axle, I put a truss on it. Um, I would say if you're serious about wheeling anything, put a truss on it. People bend Dana 60s, people bend 14 bolts, people bend big stuff all the time. Just, you know, one too many beers or whatever there's, whatever the story is, we've all heard them. Weld a truss on it while you've got it out of there. Um, if you're like me, you can build a truss from scratch. You know, I think it was like 20 or 30 bucks in material for me to weld it together or you can, you can buy an Artec kit and they're killer, a few hundred bucks, and you've got just a bulletproof setup. So it's really cheap reassurance in the long run. Dana 60 high pinion. This thing's a beast, clearly. I mean, look at the size of those humongous U-joints in the axle shafts. Um, but it's not for everybody. There are some downsides. It weighs a ton. I don't know what the exact weight is on the one that's in my shop, but just to move it from A to B, I, there's, I forget about it. I, I can't do it without a transmission jack or without my uh, cherry picker or something like that. So I don't know if it weighs double what my Dana 44 weighs, but good Lord, it's definitely heavier. <laughs> now weight being down low right on the ground, unsprung weight is not a bad thing to everybody. I know that I could certainly use a little unsprung weight in the front of mine to help keep those tires down, but I also like the way a lightweight vehicle handles. So you just gotta take those things into consideration with your build. Recommendations for the Dana 60 high pinion. I would say that if you have 30, less than 37s, I, I would not go less than a 37 on a Dana 60. It's just, you're gonna lose too much ground clearance and add too much weight for the benefit that you get. Cause you could easily just throw a set of chromolis into a, a Dana 44, or you could build the crap out of a Dana 30 and you could probably be pretty comfortable. Um, now this is, you know, this is talking to people that have lighter weight rigs, XJs, TJs, YJs alike. I personally would not swap one of these right out of the box into my Jeep. Um, everything that I swap into my Jeep is gonna get a truss. It's gonna get aftermarket axle shafts because it, it's out. Let's make sure we don't have to think about it. You know what I mean? So it, it's another thing to put on your list to buy and that sucks and you've got a budget a little bit bigger, but it is so worth it if you plan on wheeling hard. Um, even with the Dana 60, it's just worth it to, to to build it right that first time, put it in there, and then just not, not have to worry about it anymore. If you're new to the dirt lifestyle and you wanna support the channel, please visit our website, thedirtlifestyle.com. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up, please. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed already. And if uh, you want to follow me on social media, I am at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you next time.